Welcome to the Generation Hustle Podcast, the show that explores the world of business, entrepreneurship, and culture all centered around the millennial. On episode 11, we shift into the world of sports and sit down with Canadian national women's basketball star, Maya Marie Langlois. Many of us watch and love sport, but what does it really take to succeed as an athlete? We take a look into her journey as a professional athlete, equality in the world of sports, and the reasons why diversity in sport is so key to its future growth. We hope this episode shines a light into how hard it is to actually be a professional athlete and inspire the next generation of female stars. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Maya Marie, uh, we really, really appreciate you being on. We have tons to talk about today. Uh, in terms of the world of sports, female in sports, and uh, also diversity in sports. And we feel like uh, having a Canadian champ on board and talking about this, um, you know, really cements the kind of efforts that you're making as well in terms of um, women in sports in the field. So again, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. It's not a problem. It, what else is there to do on a Thursday afternoon? <laughs> Quarantine as well, right? So. <laughs> talk, like, you know, let's talk about some real things, right? Yeah, sweet, <laughs> sweet. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, Sherston start it off uh, in terms of just how you got involved in sports and, you know, the early days. Yeah, for sure. Again, like, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. And um, we're super excited to dive into your story. So maybe we can just start off from the, a little bit from the beginning of kind of like your early interest in sports and what you got involved in and um, how you kind of got got pushed into basketball. Yeah, for sure. So we're in Windsor, Ontario. And, yeah. um, you know, I had two older brothers, one uh, single mother. And you know, we were always playing, monkeying around. So then they got into basketball and I had to go to the practice because you can't leave a seven-year-old at home mm -hmm. while you're still practicing. So then I always had to come and I had to watch. So then my mom gave me the option, well, do you want to go play or do you want to sit on the sidelines? Right. So then obviously I want to go play with my brothers and all that. So I um, went on a club team at seven years old and I played with um, – it was a guy's team because it was with my one older brother, the middle child. Right. And um, I just haven't stopped playing since then. So it's almost it. like an addiction, it. right? To just get well, hooked to it? Well, you know what? I, I don't know if it would be an addiction. Well, now I would call it an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> but at the beginning, you know, like your brothers, I didn't have a lot of toys or anything. So we just always played. We played in the backyard when it was winter time. We like rolled up a sock and played, you know, hey. on the doorway, you know, <laughs> like. Kobe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was probably before Kobe got that same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I played, I played a uh, club ball um, growing up. I played my school sports, high school. Um, I didn't even think about, you know, professional basketball because you got to understand, like, would you consider women's basketball popular now or on the rise? On the rise, I'd it's say. Still on the rise, um, yeah. There's definitely been a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, there's definitely been a lot more talk um, and uh, we'll get into this later on, but. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, but there's definitely been a lot more discussion about the WNBA and uh, female in sports in general. Exactly. That's to my point, though. So let's take it back 11 years ago or whatever. <laughs> yeah. To when I'm, well, let's say it's more than 11, but, you know, when I was 15, 16 years old, do you think the WNBA was on the radar? So yeah, a, you yeah, even no. think that you know about playing ball overseas? Yeah, yeah. I barely, at that age, I didn't even know about our national, our senior women's national team. Mm -hmm. So to, to say that it was my dream, no, but I can tell you one thing that I've never told anyone this before. We love it. <laughs> hey, we're lucky ones, eh? <laughs> but like, since when I was like, man, I'm at least like seven, eight years old. Um, you know, when you got to write in people's yearbooks? Yeah. 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 yeah so I started writing, uh, keep the signature. I'm going to be famous one day. No way. Yeah. I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> but I had no clue. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the story is still being written, and I don't think I'm done yet. I'm not even talking about ball, but, like, 
that's pretty dope when you think about it like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's hustle. That's real hustle. I, I love that. I mean, if I wrote it down, I hopefully one day I'm famous too, but I, I'm not at your level yet, but... Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I wrote that every single year in mm -hmm. every year. <laughs> <laughs> you just knew. <laughs> like one year is going to stick. Has, has anyone, just out of curiosity, has anyone from your high school or anything like that hit you up now and be like, yo, I still have this yearbook, like with your, you know? Oh, no, no. I don't think we look yeah. at yearbooks anymore. Let's be real. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Maybe but, after this podcast, they'll go back. But you know what, though? Like, uh, even my one dad, my, my only dad, um, I drew a picture of a basketball player. Yeah. And I wrote that, and I must have been like eight years old and he still had that picture that's, that's adorable awesome. yeah i love it so <laughs> so you never knew that you like this is something okay. that you want to do seriously and you just kind of like work up the ranks throughout um i guess yeah so at so i played club and uh, like i said high school and um then i went to university and at this point i still didn't know about anything and mm -hmm. the way i saw it is like my mom she told me you know, if the doors keep on opening, opening, keep on going through them. So that's why I did with ball. And, you know, just, yeah. So then I played university uh, at the University of Windsor, my hometown. I didn't go away. I didn't even get recruited much in the CIS or youth sport as we call it now. Uh, maybe two teams and one was Windsor and the other one uh, maybe out east. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't until my second year in university where um, my one best friend and my one teammate at the University of Windsor, they're like, okay, let's just go to this open tryout out in uh, Toronto, right? So this was an open tryout just to make it to the um, what is it? selected tryout. And that's okay. when the actual tryouts are. So like we had to pay our own way you know, like we were resourceful, but where we slept, you know, cause you're not going to go the day of the tryout. Yeah. Right. Anyway. So, um, so we, we tried out my best friend was on the younger, um, team. And then me and my two teammates, we, we made it to the university, um, Canadian national team. I don't know if you've heard of the Fichu games or university games. No, I have not. I've, I've heard a little bit about it. I looked it up yeah. while I was, while I was so looking you up. <laughs> yeah so it's pretty much like um people under 26 um they get to represent their country and it's like a mini olympics for university kids okay right. it is so cool right yeah. <laughs> like you have your own athlete village you know it's just like the olympics oh. i'm telling you because i've oh, been no home, way. Right? <laughs> and okay. it's it's similar they try yeah. it's it's almost like a preparation like they teach you well it taught me like you're in big environment you know like thousands ten thousand other elite athletes you know and yeah. uh, you're playing different countries so i made it on that team and uh it's it was actually the head coach was the team was the coach that i beat that we beat in the national championship it was <laughs> <laughs> oh no way yeah so like there's no connection or relevance to what i'm about to say but i barely played that, that <laughs> no connection whatsoever oh because she's my national team coach now so no connection <laughs> okay okay fair, yeah, fair, fair. Yeah. um but yeah i probably only averaged about like maybe seven minutes a game but um and that was like we were out in china i've never been like I didn't play Team Ontario. I didn't do all these JDPs or I don't even know if they have these. There's no prep school. You know, I just literally played with my brothers, played on my club, played at school. You know, like, I feel like anyone who liked basketball did that. Right. Yeah. So that's, so then after that, and I played against the girls and, you know, against other people around the world, I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> I said, if I, if I actually put some training into it, if I actually put my efforts into it, mm -hmm. I can do this. And I don't know. I wasn't discouraged. It just, I think that's where, you know, I guess that was my real big goal I've ever, I had. So 
I was just, I just became focused. And, you know, since I touched down from the plane in China, from China, probably like three days later, that's when I started really training. Wow. So, so it wasn't even until like, I was like nine, I was like 19, 20 years old. Wow. So, so normally it's like the other way, right? You start here and you're like, all right, I'm gonna make it like around the world and stuff, but you went around the world and you're like, Oh, I can do this now. Like, I, <laughs> I mean, I guess I am like, like I stayed in Windsor until I was 23 years. Okay. At that point I was like 20 years old, right? 19, 20 years old. Like I didn't go to Trump. Like it was, we didn't really go anywhere. Right. 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 So how are you supposed to know? You hear, oh yeah, you're good, you're good, you're all right. But like, I didn't go to school in the States. I stayed in my hometown yeah. and they weren't even like, they were pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. I didn't have a good history. So after that, I was like, this is, I can do this. I just, I had to keep on going. Yeah. And then yeah. that's when the grind really started. Right. <laughs> so, so one of the things that we wanted to know is kind of like, some of the challenges you had kind of coming up through this um, and you touched on a couple already, like there wasn't a lot of information. You didn't know where to, where to get information. Like what are the challenges that you have to go through um, th throughout this process? There's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Like, but at the time you don't see it as challenges. You see it as, okay, I, I got to do this to get it done. So my biggest challenge was probably to be extremely resourceful right mm -hmm. so in terms of in terms of how to get better right like I was at one point I was so dedicated that or I didn't even have a sense of direction because no one really did what I've done in my city right, right. Terms, yeah. you know but like I went from one trainer to the next trainer to the next trainer to the next, just anyone that I was driving across the city from one practice to the next, just to get something in because I knew it was more than what I knew. Right. Right. Then um, another challenge, um, I guess to build onto that is just like not having anyone in my profession or having to deal with it like right family members talk about right. friends they don't know how to pick an agent yeah. <laughs> they don't know when it's a good contract they don't know what it feels like when you're in a slump in your game you know they don't understand that you got to get up and practice two times a day right right so they think you're just crazy and yet again a lot of people just see it as a game mm-hmm mm -hmm. As so, yeah. fans, as fans, we, we definitely do see it just as a game and hey, you guys are athletes and it's expected of you, but we don't know what the grind behind what you guys actually do night and day out. Yeah. Okay. And it's the sacrifices. Yeah. Right. right. It, it's just the sacrifices. But like, don't get me wrong. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. But it's, it's more than a pretty picture. For sure. Yeah, and it's paid off in, in, in spades now, right? So uh, we, we, we love to see that, that, climb, that climb story of, of athletes, yeah. especially. I feel like, like this goes into a, like, a lot of different topics that we want to talk about, but then it goes to like, all right, another challenge is that, you know, my, my dad's Guyanese, right? For mm -hmm. those who don't know where, what Guyana is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Alberta. Right we now. don't know what can I am. Yeah. I'm in Alberta. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're okay. in Brampton. We're yeah. in Brampton. So in Brampton, okay. Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. So we know. So my dad's from Guyana and then my mom's um, black and white. Right. So right. I like I grew up with my mom. So that was like black culture. Mm -hmm. And now we go see my cousins, which is the Caribbean culture. And now right. I'm stuck. So not stuck, I should say. Now I'm like with a lot of my basketball teams, I'm put in another situation of being all white and most of them have money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's another challenge, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, mu it must have been quite challenging kind of uh, coming from those circumstances, comparing yourself. Uh, maybe they had prep schools that they went to 
versus your kind of more traditional, I guess, uh, hustle and bustle. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, the other athletes didn't hustle, but I'm no, saying. No, but like you said, uh, you have to be, re I had to be resourceful. Yeah, resourceful. That's right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you don't realize it going through it. Right. You're like, oh, that's right. why I felt this way. You don't know. Oh, that's why it was like a little weird or, oh, that's why it's, I seemed a little different to them, you know? Yeah. So it was just like stuff like that. But luckily, like, I am very thankful. I've had some amazing people in my life that has helped me as far as like my coach driving across the city to pick me up, to go drive back to his end so he, I can go to practice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair. Fair. You know, so like I've had good people that have helped me along the way or else if I couldn't get a ride, I wasn't going. Right. Sure. Right. <laughs> and so like now you've like experienced like you've gone to Pan the Pan American Games, the FIBA Women's America Cup and the Olympics as well. So walk us through like what it's like being uh, on the stage and your first game on such a global stage. OK, so you forgot the world championship. Yeah. Uh, well, that's important because we'll that's bigger than Pan Am's. Yeah, and it's it's almost similar. It is the same as the Olympics, but the Olympics just yeah multiple sports in one venue area. Mm -hmm, right. But I say that because that was my first big stage, the World Championship. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, like still, I was I was twenty twenty three years old, and. Um, it was my first year making the national team, yeah. the senior women's national team. And uh, shoot, it was in Turkey. And still at this time, WNBA, eh, it's still not that big. You know, I, I'm on the senior women's national team, so I know a bit more, right? Yeah, now, right. Yeah. Like, so we go to the world championship and we're playing against the best woman in the world. And yeah. I just graduated university. That's like, in April, the World Championships in September, and I've been playing against Canadian women's basketball university. Yep. And now, five, four or five months later, I'm playing against the best women in the world. Man, I got my, like, the point guards. See, and then that was my, sorry, I get excited. No, no, go oh, for we it. We love it. Yeah, we love, we love it. it. So then that was my next little goal. Boom, right? I'm like, man, these point guards are smart. They're just freaking, they just, they're, they just know everything. And yeah. I did not like my basketball IQ that summer went up like through because I had to, cause I'm coming in as a point guard. Right. And the point guard has to lead a team. Yeah. Now I'm 23 years old and I have to lead professional basketball players who already been to the Olympics prior to me. Right? Yeah. I have to tell them where to go. I have to know the place. I have to make the right call. And I was playing like 20 minutes. So that's a significant role. Yep. I was getting yelled at. I got hit with screams. Like, I got, like, we did well as a team. Like, obviously, my competitiveness, you know, it kicks in. If you, you ball, you ball, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But, like, you know, there's just, that was another little thing. I was like, man, okay, if I now get up here, right, I can. I can do better. So that was my next goal. That was, you know, I knew there's, I had to improve my leadership on my mm -hmm. mental skills, just how I approached the game. And let me tell you, sorry, I was 23. And like I was saying, basketball, women's basketball is still not that big, but we're in Turkey and we, and I look up on his, in the stadium and there's pictures of women, women basketball teams up no there. Way. They won um, their league championship. They, they won the Euro league, you know, like, yeah. so that's, that showed me a whole nother world. That showed me the professional world of basketball. Yeah. That there are opportunities. That there are yeah. opportunities. Yeah. I'm like, yo, I'm playing against her at the World Championship. I'm going to play against her. I'm going to play against her. And it's just like, that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. so one, it's like, hey, you, you kind of learned for, uh, to be better at the game of basketball just through, you know, uh, some of the struggles that you went through during the tournament. But uh, and the experiences of playing with, uh, you know, great players. And then two, yeah. you saw like almost like a uh, revelation in terms of, hey, there's a lot of women that play professional basketball and they're kind of, you know, promoted in like other areas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was like, 
that was cool. And that's when I, I guess you can say I started to respect the game, appreciate mm-hmm. the game. You know, I really do believe kids these days should learn the history of it because then when they're on the court, you know, you have more heart into it. Exactly. And so that brings us to our next point. What's it like representing our country and winning gold? Okay. Um, gold in the Pan Ams. <laughs> so I'm not trying to play down this gold medal. Don't get me wrong. It's amazing. But like, so we played in the Pan Am tournament and that doesn't mean anything for basketball in terms of qualification for the Olympics. Okay. Now you got to remember we, it might be like the Pan Ams or world championship, but every of those tournaments are just steps to get to the Olympics. So right. that was just like a practice round before our Olympic qualified tournament, which was two weeks later. So like right. we were excited. It was fun, especially the fact that I was in Toronto. Oh yeah. <laughs> Like, it's not even about the basketball, but you wear that medal out in Toronto for that whole week. <laughs> like, you get in anywhere. Yeah, it is bottle cool. service, free bottle service. Yeah, <laughs> it was like my friend volunteered as like one of the the, help, the volunteers at Pan Am, and she asked me to join her. I was like, I wasn't able to, but now I look back, I'm like, man, that would have been an amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so cool. The whole it's next time. <laughs> You can try next. Time. So, so what I, I know COVID hit, but uh, do you, do you kind of foresee like tournaments open up next year? Um, and like, what, what's it been like kind of with all these cancellations around the world? And I'm, I'm sure it's impacted you in some way, but uh, in terms of playing, but uh, what, what, what's your kind of foresight into what's going to happen in the sport? With sport? As well? uh, what, yeah. Basketball specifically. Like my basketball? Or yeah, like with female, uh, women's basketball. <laughs> no, I mean, like, we already we have team meetings still with the national team. Like, perf- WNBA is going, NBA is going, college is going to go. Like, they're not going to postpone the Olympics if everybody's returning to sport. Yeah, I mean, they skipped it this year. Hopefully next year as well. No, it is. It's yeah. scheduled for in July. Oh, actually? Of next year? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm hoping we get some just a sort of vaccine or something so everyone can actually attend it and uh, it that would works out. It be different, like the village. I think regardless if we do get a vaccine, it's still going to be, you can't go anywhere. Oh, gosh, that's, that would suck, actually. <laughs> that ruins the point of the village. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it ruins the point. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. Well, um, so let's like kind of uh, almost move back a little. And we're we're specifically talking about female in sports. What would you kind of, uh, I know you had a different upbringing in terms of you learning about certain things um, in terms of female sports and basketball in general. But what would you say younger generation of female athletes can do in terms of following your footsteps? And what kind of stepping stones are there for them to kind of lead and be in a position of say going to the WNBA or in a Euro league or wherever it may, it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, well, sorry for basketball. Um, there's, there's mixed. I believe in this, but then it's just like, I understand why people. Okay. So let me just tell you, <laughs> I do think that you should like, let's say pick a skill, right? Yep. And then work on that for a month. And then after a month decide, do I want to level up on the same skill or do something different? But you have to give yourself a chance to get good at it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people want to go from one move to the next to like, oh, okay, boom, boom, boom. But they can't even, they don't know the timing of the move. They don't know the reads of the move. They don't know the effectiveness of, of it, right? So it's just like, yeah, you can do it, but you're not doing much with the ball or you're not making a play. Right. So that's, that's what I, and like, you know, that goes for all skill sets. So that goes for shooting, that goes for dribbling, that goes for um, attacking to the rim, you know, that goes for each position too, right? That goes yeah. to the point guard, to the shooter guard, like to make it, you gotta be great at something. You can't be good at everything. And you're, I feel, and it is my belief that 
if you do become great at something, you will make it far. Yeah. Yeah. I always look at like some NBA players, like let's not look at LeBron cause he's kind of good at everything, but uh, like Steph Curry, like he's the best shooter ever. Yeah. Um, and that's his one, like, I guess, known trait. Um, and there's a lot of other NBA players that are just maybe super like defensive specialists. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, but people try to, they want to be the greatest. Mm-hmm. So they want to do everything. Yeah. Right. And go one great, one thing at a time, build yourself, like build yourself from when you first start playing rather than just making this little gains. You can go like, Oh, get notice. Oh, okay. You can shoot. Well, next in the next year or two, boom, they can dribble and shoot. Yeah. Your value just increases. Yeah. And I think that's great advice even outside of sports. It's just like, you don't have to become a jack of all trades. Like if you become an expert in some field, you provide a lot of value to whatever you're doing. Well, yeah. And I agree. And like the advice I'm saying is actually what I'm trying to do with like my next career. So it's just, it is, it is hard though. (laughs) Do you have plans of one day uh, maybe becoming like a coach or doing something along those lines? No, I wouldn't be a head coach. No head coach. I will. I can, I'm good. I'm a good trainer. I'm good at developing players. Like that. That's something that I've done since I was like, I built my own game. I've learned a lot of things like different resources and I've traveled the world more than um, a lot of other athletes. Mm -hmm. And I would train in each city I'm in. Right. It didn't matter where I was in the world. So like, you know, I trained one summer in Detroit. I I trained one summer in Toronto. I trained one summer in Romania. You know, I've, I've been training in Russia, you know, so like, I see the different skill sets and different styles and how, you know, and I can just, I'm, I'm good with people and I know, I know the game. So I'd be a player development, uh, developer. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, so let's actually move into professional sports now. And maybe one of the most controversial topics we'll actually talk about here is the equality in professional sports. Um, we all know that there's a huge gap between a men's league versus a female's league. Um, and a lot of it has uh, been brought up in the media nowadays, um, especially when it comes to like equal rights. Uh, let's talk about pay, for example. Um, WNBA is obviously pushing for it. I know the American U.S. soccer team uh, actually achieved some success around this. But what is your opinion on these kind of challenges women's face in terms of equality in sport? Well, I think it's um, – I think people have to understand – each stance like I could speak about somewhat about the WNBA but like they're not really asking for the same um dollar amount yeah right Right. because let's let's it's a it's a business sport is entertainment you need to make money that's why people do it right so if men if the men's side the NBA is making more revenue than the females how there's no way that you can get you can equate the same thing yeah there's no way so people, that's the misconception first off. They just want a equal opportunity to make the same amount if they can increase their revenues. So that takes it to a percentage of the revenues. If right. you understand, right? Yeah. So the women, I think they're making like between the owner and players, like 80 for the owner and 20 for the player. And then in the NBA, it's, I don't know, maybe 50 or 53, something like 53% the players get of the revenues and then the owners get the rest. So, I mean, I, it's, I'm in business. So like, I understand the business side, but you know, it's not human from the world. It's not, you gotta, you can't forget the human factor. So, So, sorry. No, no, go ahead. So I think for, in terms of pay, they're just saying, give them a chance to or give them that opportunity to get that percent same percentage so i guess the real question is like how do you increase the revenues for women's sport for the WNBA? right that would be the real question um but i think it's you know the WNBA is only 23 years old the nba yeah. is like 75 years old now yeah. if you if you remove sport and look at business wise right a lot of times, like in terms of the um, 
young businesses, you know, you don't make as much at sacrifice. Yeah. Old businesses, that's when you make the profits. Right. Um, so, like, I think people lose sight of how old a WNBA is and that, you know, when it is a new business, you do have to market that. And that's something women's, the WNBA lacks. It's the marketing and that. Right. Right. Yeah. In my opinion. In my opinion. So, how would you do that? <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think you think, uh, you know, how um, the NBA has their own players league? I'm pretty sure the women's league has their own. Do you think there's some some ways of having better representation, um, kind of leading these uh, discussions in terms of um, representing the women's players union um, and pushing towards those kind of goals? Um, I think that I, I don't, I'm pretty, they're represented by like, and that's an, another difference. Women, the WNBA players, I would say, I'm pretty sure they have to graduate university. Oh, to go into oh that's a requirement. Or something. I, I am not sure, but they have to stay in school longer. So majority, I would say over 70% have their, unless if they failed, I don't know, but have their diplomas. I'm just looking this up right now. The WNBA yeah. requires players to be at least 22 and to have completed their college elig eligibility and graduated from a four-year college uh, wow. course. Yes. That's, that's crazy. So, like, you got you got people from Stanford. You have people from, you know, yeah, you got the Ivy League school, um, players in the WNBA who graduated. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, they, they are fighting for it, and they did just um, come up with a new agreement. And you, you got to see, like, the WNBA players, they had to fly commercial until this yeah. year. And, you, like, these women are big. They're big. Yeah. They're like seven. They're, like, yeah. it's hard for them to sit in a normal plane. I mean, I'm 5'8", and it's, like, not that. I mean, it's fine, but I couldn't imagine being bigger and having yeah. a commercial. And then that's on the time of the airplanes, on the airlines, right? And even as simple, okay, yeah, women, they do have to bear the baby, mm -hmm. right? So they actually implemented childcare and getting paid for during pregnancy and all that. Yeah. You know, right. like it's actually stuff like that they're fighting for to make their everyday life better. They know it, it's not about the money, like I said, it's about respecting women yeah. I would say what they go through right and um accommodate that in different ways other than monetary value and I think that's that's a step in the right direction uh, right so um if we look at any kind of sport um female wise I think there's been a lot of um move towards you know equal rights and uh like WNBA is doing a great job uh, well, is, See think them. about it why because they understand what it they understand the struggle they're yeah. constantly fighting for the struggle mm -hmm. right it's intersectionality that's what it is and like you can even go back like that's always been the case if you want to go racial as in you know ah, it doesn't matter anyways you know you can't get ahead if you're not trying to raise everyone if you struggle and the person next to you struggle in order to rise you, they have to rise with you yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And so one of the questions I had is like, we all, we always see like sponsorships for male athletes, like look at LeBron with Nike and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, where do you kind of see the disconnect uh, with females and potential sponsorship? I know there's some prominent females within sport like Serena, but that's an individual in a like global stage sport, I would say. Um, how, how do like maybe women utilize their brands a bit better to maybe get more opportunities um, for sponsorship or stuff like that? Man, you know what? I ask myself that question so often because <laughs> if I, <laughs> I should have went into marketing <laughs> because I know a lot of people that need to be in the magazines who are, I mean, let's be real. It's about beauty too. It's about, yeah. and being good at your sport. Well, there's right. a lot of people out there that's like that, you know? Look at our Canadian national team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, I'm not, that's, that's something, that's where 
I'm weak at that area. So it's not my strength. I, uh, branding, it takes, it takes, I guess, the leadership position. If you want to go into diversity, understanding mm -hmm. that part, if a whole bunch of white males have been running the world and big businesses, why do you think they're going to? Yeah. Invest in yeah. a not even invest. You probably don't even think about it. Yeah, exactly. It's your way of thinking, you know, and that's the point of that's the point of having a diverse leadership position is because they think differently, they grew up differently, so they see the world differently, and they, yeah. they will reach a demographic that you could not even see. Not, and it's not because um, I'm not even calling everybody racist or anything, but you know, it's how you grow up, it's the environment, it's your perspective. Yeah. And, and it's sad because like there, there are a lot of uh, young female athletes looking for some athletes to look up to, you know, as role models. Yeah. And um, if it's just male athletes, like, hey, I'm a female basketball player and maybe I'm just looking at LeBron or whatever it is, that's, there's a disconnect there. Like yeah. um, there should be some type of like system in place. I mean, hopefully it comes to fruition, but um, females need female representation. And I think <laughs> that's what's kind of missing in terms of, the formula around sponsorship or even growth in the sport. Yeah, I agree. Um, sponsorship, growth, like, I mean, if you even want to go back to the NBA and the G, and the G League, which yeah. is the B League, but now it's Gatorade. So what yeah. that sponsorship, so now their players get to, what, get paid more in the G League, who doesn't even make profit either. Yeah. But right. they're, getting, they're getting the marketing, they're getting the advertisement, they're getting the sponsorships. Right. Yeah, we're the NBA is the parent of WNBA, just right. like too. So, yeah, for sure. And, and, and you touched on it in the beginning as well. Like when we were talking about your journey into sports, like you were, you were saying, like I didn't have a role model, I didn't know what to do, right? So I, I definitely think there's a lot of room for growth in that area. Um, but one thing I really liked, like in in what you were explaining there, was kind of like you were like I built this, right? Like I built this, I worked on every skill myself because like I had nothing to look at, yeah. and like that takes a lot of like that that takes a lot of mental toughness. So like that's what I wanted to like pivot into next. Like, can you talk to us about like the importance of kind of like your mental preparation, like even like from the beginning when you were just starting in sports to when you were like killing it in the Olympics, like. It's two different levels, but can you talk to us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. And um, I remember the summer where my mentality kind of changed for the better. Yeah. So um, I made the university um, national team when I was uh, 19 or 20. And then I was on that team for two years after that. Right. So each year I got a bit more playing time. So the summer leading up to that last year at the university game, I worked out on the east side of my city and um, he was, I did strength and footwork, which I didn't know the importance of. Yeah. Not even when I was then, probably I learned that two summers ago when I was training in Detroit. Anyways, okay. so, but like we we're working on footwork, we we're working on strength and then I go do ball handling. But like this was an American um, guy who played in the CFL and he was running a training facility for elite athletes. And um, it's the mindset, man. You know, they'd be like, work harder, work harder, but because you deserve it, because you work hard, you're the best. You know, it's just like, you're the best, you work hard, no one works harder than you. Like, it's like unleashing that beast, right? And that mama mentality. Yeah. So, you know, it was that summer, and then I go um, to the university games, Fichu games. And like, you know, I, I dropped like 25 in a couple of games, you know, and like I was starting, I was like picking, playing defense like crazy. I was just like, I was killing it, but I didn't kill it the two summers before. And it was that summer in that tournament where I really got noticed for the senior national team. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so like you, the mentality you need or you like, you need to practice that too. And that came with, you know, working out with that football player that yeah. one summer where it was just constant, constant, constant. And I'm, I don't, I'm not aggressive when I play. I'm not like, I'm, I'm not a dog, but it's all up here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you, how, how do you continue to practice that? Like, because I like, obviously I think that's something that's really important for everyone to invest in like your mental preparation. Yeah. Um, 
so like since that since since working out with him like how do you continue to kind of do that for yourself well you, like <laughs> that that is hard because that did not come natural to me what came right. natural to me in my mental toughness was um being calm and now that i look back at it is being able to um lead my team right i know that people it's hard for it's hard to understand the connection between mental and leading but like i was i don't know maybe it was, i don't know maybe it's my ability to be under pressure my my ability to connect with players maybe it's um just playing bigger than myself and that would that could have been it i don't really know what it is but um that was my natural um, mental toughness or mental leadership or whatever you want to call it so for me to feel like i deserve to take that shot which kind of go against the traditional point guard um that's what i needed at that time so like it for just sure. depends on your role on the team and how you want to approach that season for sure I, I feel like a lot of your mentality is kind of just like well i'm here so i might as well be good at it right like like i feel like that's kind of what's been throughout the story you're just like i'm here might as well do it well yeah yeah <laughs> that you know what that's way better than my explanation <laughs> <laughs> no I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get it out of you right like because obviously yeah. we want to understand that mentality too like obviously i'm not playing in the olympics but i can i can learn from that and apply that in other areas yeah like if you're gonna do something like give it a try actually give it a try For don't sure. tell yourself short for sure it's scary so, don't get me wrong <laughs> yeah so on that note, like w one question I always like to ask ball players is like, are you a are you a home player or an away player? Like, which do you prefer? And that plays into your mental aspect too, right? Like some guys or some people love playing in front of the home crowd, and some people love shutting up the away crowd. So it's like, which one is it for you? All right, so <laughs> I got stories on top of stories. <laughs> go for it, go for it. We want to know. So like. When you ask me that question, I think of two different scenarios. Um, back in university, we won two championships at home in Windsor, and we won two championships away. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out which was the best feeling, and I would have to say in university, it was at home. Okay. Because okay. my mom and my grandma and my little sister got to watch me. Yeah. Right. So then I guess like uh, being away, like when you're outside of Canada and no one knows who you are, it feels like every game's away. Right. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> like, like we had crowds at the University of Windsor. Like there was a lot of people, there was like signs being made, like other sports were coming, painting their bodies. Like they don't do that anymore, <laughs> especially for women's basketball. So like, I like, you really feel the home crowd and then even for the Olympic qualifier, it was in Edmonton. That was home crowd. Then at the end of the game, for, like we qualified for the Olympics, and um, you know you got the whole the whole gym singing "All Canada." That's yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. So assuming that regardless, home and away, I'm winning the championship. <laughs> yeah, it, it <laughs> it's it's all good, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. So uh, moving on to like a very important topic, and we've touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, it's diversity in sport, right? Uh, a lot of sports we see, like I'll give you the example of hockey, it's predominantly white from the athlete level and the management level. But if I look at the administrative level in any other league, it tends to be predominantly white again. So uh, from a leadership perspective, how can diverse leadership kind of help grow a sport and get more athletes involved and or bring up more opportunities for um, even sponsorship and or uh, athletes themselves? I mean, let's go with the last point because it's the one I remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, like it touches back as if you see more um, diverse people in leadership you have the younger generation believing they can do it, you know? So, you know, they have someone they can follow. If they see a path, you don't have to take the same path, yep. but you know a path exists. That's the most right. important part, right? Um, 
what was your other one? Sorry. Uh, basically how, how like kind of leadership can evolve uh, at the admin okay. administrative level involving more colored individuals that obviously a lot of us love sport, but let's face it, it's predominantly white owned, white management, um, running maybe a culturally diverse subset of athletes. Yeah. So like, I mean, there's studies proven already. I don't know the numbers, but they're facts. <laughs> um, you know, when you have a diverse leadership, you make, it's better for your business. You make more profits. You make more sales, obviously, you know. Um, how does that happen? Well, that goes down to team morale, team culture, which brings you to uh, more efficient people and people buying and believing into your business or team. Do you know what it's like when you have all your employees or players buy into what the coach says or the manager? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like, that's a winning team. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that means profit or that means wins, whatever way you want to look at it, whatever way you want to, whatever word you want to use. So on top of that, it's just like with diverse leadership, you have the role models, you have people who, you know, they understand your culture. They yeah. understand that there might be different social norms, mm -hmm. right? So if it's predominantly one way, let's say a white male, they have a homogeneous way of thinking and they're less understanding or, and with less understanding, you don't have the, the players or people buying in. They feel like they're not heard. They feel like they're not understood. They don't work as hard for you. Yep. They, they don't care. Right. So what yep. you have to do with a diverse leadership is that you like, it shows that, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter about my differences. It matters my strength. And now you're empowering that person. Yeah. Now you're empowering them and you, you, you know, you let them do, they know they're heard in the decision-making process, which means they take more accountability for their work and efforts that they contribute. Right. Yeah. 100%. I 100% agree with that. And then from that point, I, I see you're wearing a uh, shirt saying black woman, beautiful. What's the other words? Magic. And, oh, there's a lot oh, of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of representation in sports, um, we, we've seen obviously the BLM movement recently. What do you feel like athletes of color should be doing or be more involved in kind of representing or using their brands to voice out? I know LeBron is a huge guy when he does this stuff and even a lot of the subset of NBA players. But in terms of athletes themselves, do you think they should be involved in these kind of things and voicing their opinions and making yeah. a difference? Well, yeah, let's it go. <laughs> it's funny. We talk about everything here. But um, it's like we said, like I said, it's sport and entertainment. It's a business. Mm -hmm. So doesn't matter what the business is. Does is it right for the employer to mistreat the employee? No, I no, like it's not right. So why can a sports worker voice their opinion and have their representation and feel like they are being heard. Why, why do we have to shut up? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like that a lot. Really good perspective on that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, it's, it's definitely a topic like, that sure. sports is politics. Yeah. That it's, and it's been politics. You can go to the 1968 Olympics, right? Yeah. You know, you had the black power on yeah. the podium. Right. And you have like, yeah. Yeah. The and kneeling that's the, going the, on. The kneeling, Ka which, Kaepernick. Been, which yeah. has been done years before, decades before. Yeah. Like, this right. is an ongoing battle. It's just, it's just, we're lucky that we're awakening and we are learning from the past in order to improve. Yeah. And we actually had another guest who talked about some similar items. Uh, his name's Randy. Um, and he talked about this collective kind of coming together. Uh, let's, for example, talk about the NBA. It's predominantly black league uh, and also athletes are black. Um, and he talks about this collective uh, kind of brotherhood and really taking that. And really, you can't run that league without those players, no, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so if all of them are kind of uh, attaching themselves to a social cause, in this case, obviously, 
uh, equality for um, African Americans in whatever country it, it is. Yeah, man, it's not even just strictly about yeah. African Americans, though. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a, it's you were leaving. for any race or yeah. any. Yeah, it's, it's anyone at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's important. And yeah. No, 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 that's cool. That's cool. I mean, I think it's important for athletes. Uh, I mean, that's one thing we do in this podcast. We share controversial topics. We want mm -hmm. the truth uh, from the perspective of that individual. And so, again, uh, Maya Marie, uh, we truly, truly appreciate you having you on. Uh, that kind of uh, summarizes it. But before we uh, let you go, we do a little fun little lightning round. So right. we ask you, you know, we, we've grilled you on all the basketball questions and all that stuff, but let's get to know you a bit personal. So um, I'm going to let Sheriston run this and uh, you have like five to 10 seconds to answer each question. Let's go. Okay. All right. All right. You're ready. Okay. We'll start with something easy. All right. All right. What, was, what is your favorite book of all time? If you had to pick one. The autobiography of Asada Shakur. Ooh. All right. I like it. Now I'm reading this new book. Well, not new, but this other book. And I think it's climbing up there too. Which one's that? Um, the Revolt of the Black Athlete by Harry Edwards. Perfect. Must read for everyone. I'm sorry. It's a must read. I love we, it. Ties we, right we, we give out topic. book recommendations out. So we'll definitely uh, shoot that out. All right. Growing up, who is your favorite athlete of all time? Tracy McGrady. Whoa. Ooh. Okay. Okay. What about right now? Westbrook. Okay. Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> Triple double machine. <laughs> if you had to pick a future career between these two, would you rather be a WNBA coach or a future GM? GM. I like it. I like it. Um, this is one of our, this is the, the question that we fight about a lot on this podcast. Uh, and it's kind of just out of left field. Do you like pineapple on your pizza or no? Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. What are you? Who said no? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. From a guest standpoint, like 90% have said yes. But it, yeah, between us, it's only me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm probably just going to do like a podcast myself, just eating pineapples on pizza. But <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But <laughs> I mean, what? we got to get people saying yes to this i have one last question though okay i feel like as an athlete especially as a ball player like you always have that one game or like something that sticks in the back of your mind like what is like what is that for you do you have one memorable game that you can go back to like maybe yeah i guess the one that actually sticks into my mind is you know we're playing my uh oh shoot there's two Ooh, okay <laughs> all right you know, my rival Western, it was rival of the University of Windsor, and we were down, and you know what, I think I, like, stole the ball, like, back to back, hit some threes, and, like, I just remember I was definitely in that flow that Kobe Bryant talks about, you yeah. know what I'm saying, and yeah. you don't think, you just do, so, and then the other one, obviously similar situation, but we're playing one of the best teams in um, the EuroLeague, and my team were not supposed to win. And like we lost by like 10 points, but like I was shooting like zero for like four from the three pointer. And then I ended the game uh, five for nine. Nice. I was just like, I was balling. Everyone thought yeah. that I was going, they're going to try to pick me up for another team because that's <laughs> how you do it out there in Russia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You're so, trying to get a new contract out there. You no, know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. We're going to try and uh, go back and find these highlights. I want to check out these games. Oh, yeah. Good luck, man. I played in Russia, Siberia. <laughs> oh. Has to be some kind of recording, right? Yeah, it's all in Russian writing. But that league is pretty dope. Like, that league, there's Brittany Griner, Diana Tarazi. Like, yeah. anyways, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Well, my, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I, I have go. to ask one question just because you brought up Brittany Griner. I didn't want to ask this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> she brought it up. I got to ask. So, uh, obviously, like, uh, you know, do you know of the beef between Brittany Griner and DeMarcus Cousins? No, tell me about it. I'm not good with celebrity gossip. Oh, shit. Okay, all right. I don't know how it started, but essentially, someone put out the idea that 
Brittany Griner could uh, beat DeMarcus Cousins one on one, and he got pissed. <laughs> he, got <laughs> he got pissed. He got pissed. And I think uh, was it uh, Brittany actually responded saying I'd uh, I'd beat him like seven nothing in a game or or I would. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Oh man. Yeah, yeah she hit him up. She was like, "Let's go, little man. Like, you know, let, let, let's do a one on one game." And she and they were going back and forth. So like, <laughs> I wish they would have done it. Well, who do you think got that? Who do you think got that? If you had Grinder. to pick. Ooh, all right, you heard it here first. <laughs> I have to say, Griner. <laughs> Solidarity, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, poor Demarcus, man. Poor Demarcus. It's just getting worse for him every year. <laughs> Dude's had a bad year already, man. But yeah. it is what it is. Who are you guys going for this year or this summer? Oh, rap, raps, raps, repeat. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, Kawhi kind of left us, but that's okay. You know, I'm representing right now, so. Yeah, you really are. Right. So let let's go for a repeat. I mean, we're always underdogs, right? Like. I remember, yeah, ES- I remember I remember ESPN didn't even put us in a playoff position at the pre-rankings yeah. or whatever uh, before the season started. And I was just like, what? But you, you know? know what? That's what the Raptors need in order for them to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. If for they sure. were anything else, they're not going to win. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I had a second, I'd obviously, like, LeBron's my, my guy. So, I mean, I, I'd favor him winning and not losing in the finals. Yeah. So, like, he's we'll gone there, what, nine times and only won three? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. There's always that conversation, Jordan, LeBron, but. I hate that conversation. It's so. Um... I'm with it. But but if you were to choose, who would it be? No, it's not a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> As in, I'm not choosing, and then I refuse to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh I mean, you, can, you can choose Brittany Grind over DeMarcus, but you can't yeah. choose between LeBron and <laughs> I'm not in that fight. <laughs> oh, man. It's just start up a Twitter war. Um, Maya Marie said That's Jordan's the greatest. Branding. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Maybe LeBron will just shoot you a, shoot you a text or a message saying, hey. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm actually going to email um, this one guy, Harry Edwards. Who okay. Wrote. Harry Edwards. Yeah, I'm just going to try. And I sent him an email asking for like some advice. Yeah. So I'm gonna see. I'm I'm shooting my shot. Is he? Uh, is he sorry. Yeah, what? Uh, he's a sociologist. Uh huh. And a football player. Okay. American sociologist and civil rights activist. PhD at Cornell University. Yeah. Oh shit! A PhD, eh? Yeah. So I need some advice on some. Oh, he's the author of The Revolt of the Black Athlete. There you go, man. Yeah, yeah. you just mentioned the book. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'll send you get there. Okay, (laughs) okay. It took me me some time. (laughs) There's also actually another cool uh, NFL player um, who's a doctor. He's a black athlete. He's he's one of the old linemen for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, Mm -hmm. And he's huge on this, too. And he's like a mathematician. Um, Yeah, he has like his PhD in math as well. No, I don't know him. Uh, that that that'd be a really cool guy uh, to maybe reach out to, and he has a similar perspective on you know a lot of think, the movements going on. You think I'm gonna get an email back? I shoot your shot, man. Just, just go for it. Yeah. That, that, I mean, <laughs> hey, like, ha, ha, ha. yeah, yeah, for sure. 100%. Like, go for it. Like, obviously, like, there's multiple ways. Like, how did I reach out to you? Like, I mean, oh, this it, is different. This is. Hey, hey, hey! You gotta give yourself respect. I mean, you're right. Like, Right. So like, don't like under like kind of values here. I feel like we, we obviously got to talk to an amazing person today. So, um, you know, shoot your shot and like, we're, we're working with, uh, individuals too. And, you know, just go for it. Like maybe a technique that I use with, uh, a lot of our other guests is, um, just like making the subject line like personable, um, and, or like appealing, like in an email. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one of the ways that we've gotten like, um, there's this guy that we've gotten has like over 140,000 followers on LinkedIn. Um, and literally all I said is in, a, in the subject line, being a colored founder in 2020. Oh, cool. 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 Right. Yeah. Um, it's it just kind of mixing up the context of what's hap- happening in the world right now. Um, and you know, being, making it relevant cause he is a colored founder and there's yeah. not many of those in like the field of tech. So 
when you would write them, would you get straight to the point immediately? Or do you like, what's your, Oh, I, I, I just go straight for the point. I mean, uh, really what you're trying to sell yourself on is the value that you can also provide them. Um, cause, uh, it has to be mutually beneficial in some sort of way. Hmm. Okay. So for example, like, uh, I'll walk you through an email. Um, so I said, Hey, top 20, Oh, sorry. Uh, color founder and being in 2020. And then I would talk about, Hey, like we run a millennial based podcast for millennials, right? So we're talking to a millennial right now. And the perspective is from a millennial. Um, and so we want to share your story and failures. That's something that's usually not shared a lot. Um, and then I give examples of individuals that we've talked to, to kind of give us validity in terms of like, we're not just some like thing that's just showing up or, you know, some Joe Schmoes that have no relevance. Um, <laughs> we, we still are Joe Schmoes, but you know, we'll, we'll yeah, eventually yeah. get there yeah, slowly. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's kind of the approach I take is like, first you kind of, um, really represent the value that you're kind of providing in this context. I'm talking about my podcast. And then providing the validation in terms of we've had X, Y, Z representation on our show. So you would be a great fit. And if they see some names that they kind of recognize um, and that's happened with us, um, like we, we can actually introduce you to a couple basketball people um, if you want. I mean, Randy, he was the ex manager for Anthony Bennett. Mm -hmm. um, he's worked with all these NBA players. Um, well, I've heard about it, Randy. Randy Ose. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know about if you have an opinion about him or what, but uh, no, I've just heard stories. Like I'm, I'm surprised. I, we're, I know who you're talking about. Oh, okay, cool. And then uh, there's also a Buster. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Buster from Hoops Nation. He has a uh, Insta page that has over a million followers, and it's all basketball. Okay. Um, and he works as a course, I think he works with the NBA somehow in some capacity. Uh, but we got him on the show just cause we had somebody that we talked to like before on as a guest. And I use that as a, the value point. Um, I found out he was an advisor for that company and say, Hey, we've interviewed Swish uh, and, and talk you know, talk, talk to us. And he's like, instantly, he's like, yeah, I, I, it's personable. Right. Okay, so you're saying find, um, tell them the value add and make that um, connection. Exactly. Be person, be personable. Person. Yeah, no, it's all person connection, as in we yes. know people. Network. Yeah, you could. Yeah, network, and, and that's the easiest way to sell on or get anyone to talk to you is like, hey, I know someone that you know as a mutual connection. Uh, we've talked. We've done this, and mm -hmm. so you know, can we can we have a conversation? As easy as that. And most people are willing to have conversations. Uh, who knows? He might be a bit busy. So I'll just follow up a, a couple times. Um, and then I think one of the cool ways is like, I think if, if he's a professor, he usually has like a phone number associated with him. I just usually go directly to that. And just call them, eh? Just call them. Like, That's pretty, yeah. cool. That's pretty you, cool. You, right? You can't run away from your phone, right? So it's just like, you know, even if you left a voice message saying, hey, like, uh, Maya Marie, this is why I'm contacting you. I represent a Canadian yeah. basketball and all that. And then say, it'd be a great way to kind of uh, chat with you about X, Y, Z. That's a good idea. Thank you. I really know this is you, really good advice. You've mentioned Kobe so much, like, and he's talking about that a lot. Just cold calling people, man. Just hit them up. And if, if they respond, they respond. But what do you got to lose, right? True. That's, that, that's kind of how we, how we look at it as well. Because like, well, you we guys do this all the time. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. When we reach out to people like you, and that's why we're like, what do you mean? Like, because you weren't excited when we mentioned it. We're like, dude, we were so stoked when we found out you said yes. Like, it just, it's a hit. It's, it's just a mm. great hit, right? So. Like, just again, I'll give you some context. We talked to uh, a lot of our friends saying, hey, like, we got Maya Marie on the show, um, and she's representing Canada on the national stage. And they're like, no fucking way. Like, you actually did that? I'm like, just wait until the episode. Like, I, all, a lot of a lot of our friends are into ball, and so they're like, you know, that's really cool. Like, I, I want to uh, hear the female perspective in terms of ball, what it's mm -hmm. like. Um, so I think that's kind of what we're also sharing is like to give some of our male audience the perspective of the female yeah, athlete. Sure. I agree. Right? I agree. Right? So it's not only the female, like, um, listeners that are getting a connection, but also the male listeners are getting a totally different perspective of, 
like usually it's just like LeBron James scores 30 points, blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's, you know, it's totally, to, totally different context. And I think that's kind of what we want to share and bring uniqueness to. Yeah. If you, got, if you guys want to keep on doing that, you should definitely get some like, um, the, get the European experience. Okay. Yes. That's different. I mean, if you have anyone that we can talk to, definitely that would help. Um, Not like a woman's basketball, like. Uh, uh, it could be in any representation in terms of like player, or coach, or whatever it is. Um, generally, our focus again is more on the millennial side of things, so yeah, our so age, crowd, our yeah. age group, right? So um, it's just because like we have a different challenges and it's a bit different. Yeah, you, yeah. You should let me know what some of your ideas are in terms of basketball. Like, yeah, and be different, spin, like different perspectives, but like even like a trainer perspective, even like. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, one one of the things like we're actually running and we haven't launched yet are like these little training series or like webinars mm -hmm. of certain things. And one of the events that I actually wanted, to, I was thinking of hosting, is like almost like a a camp for like something sports related where you can meet athletes and stuff like that. And then, yeah. And so it was just like, Hey, could we get like individuals that we potentially meet and have them run? I, I mean, given COVID, I don't know if that's possible right now, but um, you know, it's just an idea that we had. It's just like, you know, it's all about hustle. That's kind of what our name is, but. I love uh, the name by the way. Yeah. Okay, sweet. <laughs> and honestly, like we, we were just thinking about it. Like, okay, what are millennials known for? It's like hustle. But what are we in like kind of known for? We're a generation of our own, you know? Yeah. Um, and so we just combined the two and we're like, you know what, let's just let's go for it. Yeah. All right, cool. Keep in touch though. Like I yeah, said. Yeah, for sure. And if we you will. need anything from us, like feel free to shoot. Like we're happy to help in any capacity. If you need advice, or, like even on emails or um, anything. Cool. Like uh, both of us are business guys. We've gone to school for business and stuff. Uh, as well so like anything you need from us you you let us know we'll definitely be in touch yeah for sure awesome 100 and we're gonna yeah sorry go ahead go ahead oh i was gonna say like is there any other feedback that you had on the podcast in terms of the vibe oh. um any of that um i Maybe like awkward it. anything no no not at all not at all um no I, like you sent the questions the day before it kind of it went in a flow um, I don't, in some podcasts, I don't, I'm not, I listen to only a couple, mm -hmm. not too many interviews though, like more like talk shows, like sometimes the host yeah, 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 more, yeah. or I don't know, yeah. like your opinion about the situation, do people like, would you want to do that? Or do you want to just hear the speaker's voice? I think we try to get a mix of most things, but uh, really what we're focusing on is getting the perspective of the uh, guest. Yeah. I, I would say people want to listen to you, not us. <laughs> yeah no i i like it but I, i'll think about it a little longer sweet no that we we appreciate that a lot all right all right guys all right have a good Stay one connected and uh we'll let night. you know when things are gonna get posted thank you so much all right night all right see ya